Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra. Now, in today's part 13, we will continue talking about matrices. But of course, before we do that, first I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. In fact, this video course here is only possible because of you. Now, one goal in this series here is to explain that a matrix defines a linear map. However, it might also be helpful that we first talk about names we use for matrices. For example, we already know that we write the matrix A as an element of the set R to the power m times n. There, the natural number m stands for the number of rows of the matrix. And on the other hand, n, the natural number n, stands for the number of columns. And now it could happen that both numbers are the same and then we would talk of a square matrix. In other words, the height and the width of the matrix are of the same size. So for example, we could have a 3 times 3 matrix. Hence, we would have 9 entries in sum. Indeed, square matrices occur often, but don't forget, it's always a special case. Okay, another special case for matrix would be to have just one column, and then we would call it a column vector. Of course, it's still a matrix by definition, but it looks like a vector. So the height of the matrix is still m, but the width is just 1. So for example, that could be a 2 times 1 matrix. So you see, this is exactly how we would denote an element in Rm. And in the end, we will see that the same notation here is not a problem at all. Okay, now if we have a column vector, you might already guess that we also need a row vector. This means this should be a matrix where the height is just 1. However, still the number of columns can be any natural number n. Now, for example, you could imagine a vector with four components. However, we see this as a matrix with one row and four columns. So essentially you see, all the names here explain themselves. However, I should add that an ordinary real number, a scalar, can also be seen as a 1 times 1 matrix. Now, the only difference we would see here is that we also would use parentheses. So in summary, what you should see here is, when we deal with matrices, a lot of other objects are also included already. By knowing this, we can go to more special matrices. For example, a very important one is the so-called diagonal matrix. Often it will be a square matrix, but the notion also makes sense for general matrices. Indeed, the idea here is that only on the diagonal of the matrix we find non-vanishing numbers. In other words, all the entries outside are just zeros. Now of course, the diagonal in the matrix is characterized by the indices of the components. More precisely, we have an element on the diagonal if the index i is the same as the index j. This means, for having a diagonal matrix, we need that aij is 0 whenever i is not the same as j. Therefore, you should see, for a square matrix, this diagonal is immediately seen as the straight line from the left top to the right bottom. In this regard, often when one says diagonal matrix, one implicitly assumes a square matrix. Okay, and now there are also other special square matrices that will be important later. For example, we can talk about so-called upper triangular matrices. There, as the name suggests, the form of the non-vanishing entries of the matrix should form an upper triangle. In other words, above the diagonal, it's also allowed to have non-zero entries. Or to formulate it in a short way, below the diagonal, we need to have zeros. This means that the index for the row, i, has to be greater than the index for the column, j. Okay, with this, it might not surprise you that we can also define the notion lower triangular matrix. It's also a square matrix, but now the zeros should lie above the diagonal. In other words, on the diagonal and below the diagonal, everything is allowed, but above the diagonal, we need to find the zeros. 
Then, of course, the formula looks the same as before, but now the column index should be greater than the row index. So for example, at this position here, we would have two for j and one for i. Okay, then I want to show you two more special square matrices. A very important one is the notion of a symmetric matrix. Also there, it might not surprise you, the diagonal of the matrix plays an important role. Namely, we find a symmetry between the upper right part here and the bottom left part here. More concretely, it's possible to reflect the matrix on the main diagonal and we don't change the matrix at all. For example, this means this entry here is the same as this entry here. In other words, for a symmetric matrix, it's possible to exchange the index for the row with the index of the column. Therefore, you see, it's important that we have a square matrix such that the number of rows coincides with the number of columns. Now, this nice reflection property here, we can also extend to a sign change. And then what we get is a so-called skew symmetric matrix. It means when we reflect the matrix on the main diagonal, we also add a minus sign. So for example, a skew symmetric matrix could look like this. So there you should see, this entry here should be the same as this entry here, with the exception of a factor minus one. And of course, we need this for all entries here. Hence, because this sign change should also happen on the main diagonal, we don't have any choice but choosing zeros there. Simply because zero is the only number that is positive and negative at the same time. Or more precisely, minus one times zero is zero again. However, here please note, for a symmetric matrix above, the main diagonal could be anything. Simply because there, we don't have a sign change. Okay, then for the definition of a skew symmetric matrix, we have the same formula as above, but with a minus sign here. So in summary, you see we have a lot of names for different matrices and why they are important, we will see in the next videos. So let's meet there and have a nice day. Bye.